Welcome to the chapel of Robinson College here at the University of Cambridge. This term we continue our series on voices from outside the window, focusing on what it means to listen well to the other. And today we're delighted to welcome Professor Judith Butler, who discusses the aggressive nature of nonviolence. Judith Butler is Maxine Elliott Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley. She is active in several human rights organisations, serves on the advisory board of the Jewish Voice for Peace, and is a corresponding fellow of the British Academy and fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her books have been translated into more than 27 languages, and today we discuss her most recent, The Force of Nonviolence. Judith Butler, a very warm welcome to Robinson College Chapel. I'm pleased to be here in the virtual sense, for sure. Yeah. Can I ask you then, um, your latest book, uh, The Force of Nonviolence, can you say something about why you felt compelled to write it? Well, I think there were several social and political phenomena that I was noticing and um, and I felt that there were some, um, not just some confusions about what constitutes violence and nonviolence, but also some pretty uh, questionable deployments of the term <laughs> violence and nonviolence. So when students protest in a nonviolent way and that's understood by rectors or provosts as um, uh, a security problem, uh, an imminent or actual uh, event of violence, then um, we, we see that the, um, the attribution of violence works in the service of censorship or the deprivation of basic uh, democratic rights, like the rights of assembly or the rights of expression. At the same time, um, I see, well, on the left, um, those who think that um, one must dismantle capitalism or oppose racism by any means necessary. And I was always nervous about by any means necessary. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh no, let's go back and read Camus uh, on, 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 the, on the just. Uh, okay, <laughs> you, yeah. can, you know, I mean, you can end up killing and murdering and making some pretty profound mistakes about who you kill or how you unleash murderous action in the world or how you um, provide an example or justification for further violence. Um, and that that worried me because I, I feel that um, if if violence becomes a means by which we oppose capitalism or racism, um, um, then uh, we we imagine that it's a means over which we are able to maintain control. But actually, it be quickly can become an end, or it can become a way of life, or it can saturate the world with more and more violent. So we live in a more violent world. And then the kind of broader ethical question is, what kind of world do we want to live in? One that is more violent or less violent? And my answer is less. So, um, you know, I think that there was some, you know, both state actions that I felt were naming things violent that were nonviolent. Uh, and there were also non-state actors who were using violence in a way that they thought was manageable. And I thought probably that's not the case. Um, so, you know, those were my motivations, I suppose, <laughs> the most proximate ones. Some of the examples you used, I think you mentioned Black Lives Matter, um, Palestine, um, where resistance to violence can be framed as an act of violence. But then on the other hand, you have people who on the left seem to get confused between force and violence. For instance, there are thinkers I've read in the US who say that now we're at the point with capitalism where the only way to oppose it is with uh, you know, buying a, a used car, parking it you know, in some very inconvenient mainstream place, pulling the battery out and walking off and bringing the cities to a standstill. I mean, is that violence or is it force? It's... 
Um, well, that particular example, I would say, is obstruction. You know, uh, there is, of course, um, a political tactic which seeks to bring the machinery to a halt. And um, we've certainly seen this uh, on the environmental left, but we've seen it in among anti-capitalists and uh, anti-globalization activists. And, you know, I believe in France some years ago, not too many, there was an effort to bring the the, the, the railway system to a halt. Um, and um, someone like Giorgio Gomben drawing on the work of, of Walter Benjamin uh, did say, look, we need an emergency break. We need, to, we, ne we need to halt the reproduction of this machinery. Now, that kind of obstruction I think is, um, is interesting. It's not, ex it, it's, it's not directly violence against people nor is it exactly violence against property. It just brings a process to a halt. So that, I wouldn't call that yeah. violent. Um, similarly, I think um, when we talk about dismantling institutions, for instance, there is um, here, as I believe there is in the UK, in a slightly different modality, a, an abolitionist movement that seeks to dismantle prisons, prisons understood as violent institutions. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not places where violent people are kept from society, they are uh, uh, more often or more prominently violent institutions that reproduce uh, uh, state violence. They are the paradigmatic um, uh, domestic instance of state violence. Um, and to dismantle, call for the dismantling, you know, sometimes people say destruction or dismantling or abolition. Well. It would be one thing to set a prison on fire, which would be a very violent act, and mm. would also hurt the prisoners inside. Right. Uh, I, I don't hear abolitionists saying that's what we should do. Okay. Um, I do hear them saying, let us dismantle the prison system and also imagine alternative ways of dealing with um, what we call crime, like inj injurious actions or, or violent actions on the part of people against other people. Um, how, how do we, how, you know, how might we approach that differently? So the call to dismantle is a call for deinstitutionalization. I don't, I don't think that it's violent. Um, it's a form of negation, taking down, but it's not a, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not violent for those who call it violent that comes from a kind of fear or a phantasm um, maybe even a relocation of the violence of the prison um, in, in the in the movement to oppose the violence in the prison right, and that's right. the nefarious use that i i really don't like and i think we need to find ways to publicly draw attention to that and and and, and show its illegitimacy that seemed to be one of the foundational moves in the book, um, where you're you're not just talking about um, two parties. You're not just talking about violence on the one side and um, you know like an active and a passive. You're talking about the wider framework that goes beyond two separate parties. Into a, a, you you use the word fantasy with a ph or an f. I wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> Or a yes. social ontology or an episteme and so on. Could you say a little bit more about that wider context in which the debate yes. is framed? We, we, I mean, scholars on violence, sociologists uh, uh, who work on the topic of violence, I'm, I'm not one of those. Um, political scientists who work on the topic of violence generally tend to develop typologies. There's individual violence against other individuals. There's group violence, there's symbolic violence, there's institutional violence, there's state violence, there's non-state based um, uh, violent action. Um, that's just a provisional list, there are many more. Um, and we think of them as separate types. Um, but yeah. I, I think we all live in a world in which certain forms of violence have been naturalized or normalized. Um, so for instance, in the struggle um, uh, against violence against women and trans people um, that is particularly strong in Latin America right now and has become a, a rallying point for uh, Latin American feminists, but also a number of allies um, on, the, 
on the progressive or left uh, political spectrum, uh, one, of the, one of the major challenges is to get communities and local governments and um, policymakers to understand that, um, that um, femicide um, or feminicidio, which includes trans people, um, especially trans women, um, but should include trans men too, um, uh, is, is understood as an act of passion, say, or uh, an understandable reaction of somebody who got out of control, but, uh, or the, the beating or killing of, of women who are wives by their husbands is understood to be private or a crime of passion or, or perhaps a path pathological moment on the part of an individual who lost control. Um, unfortunately, that kind of either pathologization or normalization, both taken together, um, uh, tends to uh, um, uh, reject the systemic quality uh, and character and force of um, a femicide. And so what does it take to see that it's a whole way of knowing and being that has been taken for granted so that even when um, a case comes, uh, you know, police are called and the police say, oh, I'm not going to take any action here. Too bad. It was private, passionate, uh, sad moment, but it's over. Uh, or they police do take action, but the courts do not or the courts take action, but then at the moment of sentencing, um, nothing happens. You know, those are examples of ways in which the crime is just exon exonerated in advance. I mean, Derek Chauvin thought he would be exonerated in advance. He's the police. We get to, you know, he's living in a world, and we can call it an episteme, mm -hmm. a generalized episteme in which white policemen get to kill black men and are never convicted. And he's He's smug. He's going to kill in front of the camera, thinking that he's exonerated in advance. Um, so, so the the question is, how do you break up an episteme like that? Um, you, um, it takes a lot, and it's a, you know, we were all amazed that Derek Chauvin was convicted. I mean, I, I don't love the carceral state being the. <laughs> You know the oh the carceral state works. Um, I don't I don't like that being the the endpoint of this, but it is significant that a jury with a significant number of white people, you know, basically didn't reproduce that episteme that yeah. would exonerate a police person. They they broke with it. They had another way of seeing. They had another way of viewing this. It it was in some ways it was it was obvious. This is murder. Every you know, the nine-year-old kid says this is murder. Everybody knows this is murder. And yet we can see the intervention of epistemes that say, well, maybe it wasn't so much murder. Maybe it was self-defense. I mean, you know, that was a big black man who was about to rise up and, and could do anything to hurt them or he deserved it. He was on this or that drug or used a counterfeit $20. But I mean, you know, there are ways of continuing to regenerate uh, what yep. we would call a racist episteme, which is part of systemic racism. And that's, that, that leads to the reproduction of violence in social life. It's neither just dyadic. We could say, oh, this was a, an encounter between three or four police people and this one man. It's like, no, this is a site for the reproduction of systemic racism and its particular forms of violence. So it makes us stand back from the particulars, even though we need the particulars to show us the structure. What do you think led to this, perhaps a change in episteme, where you say the carceral state, was it forced to make a different decision because the episteme had evolved? Well, I do think um, that the Black Lives Matter movement, or, you know, that's a particular organization, um, uh, and, and one whose aims I, I tend to agree with and support, but the movement for Black Lives is a kind of broader uh, way of speaking about um, uh, a, a much more amorphous and maybe even less organized um, public protest. Uh, it, I, th I think that it did give rise to an enormous set of cultural discussions 
in, in journalism, in the media, in educational institutions, in public life more broadly. And white people became involved both in the protests and in the discussions in ways that had been relatively uh, unprecedented. Uh, and, and I think that that really matters. You know, um, the movement for Black Lives is not an identitarian movement. It's not, oh, this is something Black people want. You know, they should like go get what they need. No, no, it, it, was, a, it was posing the question of what kind of world do we want to live in together? <laughs> and, um, and, and what are we doing to make it or to, to, to take apart what is in fact violent, what is in fact um, hatred and, uh, and racism. So I, I, think, um, I think there had to be a shift in the entire uh, global understanding of racism that had tributary effects uh, in, in the jury, in the, in the world that could now convict. Again, I don't think convictions, this one or even a litany of convictions is the same as a true structural uh, reorganization of society. I think much much broader uh, changes have to take place. And I am a little skeptical of legal convictions as being the sign of triumph, but. Okay. It, could I ask you then, it seems that one of the, the key moves towards um, this more systemic change is it used the notion of grievability. Um, and it's a phrase that resurfaces throughout the course of your argument. What makes a person grievable? Can you say a little more about this? Well, <clears throat> let me say that in, in my view, um, every person should be grievable. So that's like a, that's a normative commitment. I, 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 I believe in, I promote, you know, what I call the, <laughs> the, democ the radical democratization <laughs> of grievability. I, I, I want to live in a world in which everybody's life is valued and it would be grieved if it were lost. But the fact of the matter is we live in a world in which many lives are lost, um, uh, where the value of those lives is, is, is not acknowledged more broadly or where those lives are, um, are, are considered un ungrievable because they're not really lives or they're not worthy lives or they're, they're, not, they're not valued. Um, so we know this in war. I mean, very clearly in the United States when in the Twin Towers destruction, the Pentagon destruction, we, there were plenty of opportunities to know the, the names and even get a short story about each of those people. But when we started bombing and killing in Afghanistan, uh, we, we, we never knew those names and we assumed that those names were unpronounceable and we had no idea about what those lives are. And in, in war, sometimes, not, not in, interestingly enough, in some classical situations where you did honor the dead that you killed, uh, uh, but but in modern warfare, it's like it's anonymous death. It's, it's it's ungrievable because it's massive and because oh, those were targets, not humans, and um, they didn't have lives or names. So, um, so you know that there's that, but there are also the lives of the migrants crossing the Mediterranean. Do we do we ever see a, you know the the collective obituary? Do we ever see the names and the lives do, or do we do we do we work to to learn those names and to learn how to pronounce them it, it, it's you know it's it's mm -hmm. it, it, we 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 consider it a demographic problem or um uh but they're they're not openly grievable uh they're they're not they're not acknowledged indeed they would not have been abandoned had they been considered grievable so in my in my view um to develop an, an ethical perspective on nonviolence, uh, one has to understand that grievability is a feature that belongs to the living, right? Um, right. If I live with an understanding of myself as grievable, then I understand that my life has some value and that it would matter to others were I to disappear, to die, to be destroyed, uh, were, I, were I destroyed. And, and um, and that's, that's to bear a sense of value um, and also maybe 
to stay alive in part because of the value one has for others or the need others have for you or uh, the ways in which one is uh, implicated in community or in, um, in a larger world. Uh, so a, a sense of one's value, I think, um, implies a sense of grievability. But if I feel that this life or the life of those like me uh, could be lost at an instant um, and would not be marked or acknowledged, that no one would ever know my name or care about my disappearance or destruction, then I'm living in a world in which I'm already negated prior to being dead. <laughs> in other words, I don't quite belong to the world of the living. I don't quite belong to the world of the human of the human life that bears value on outside that world. And, um, and I think um, that if one has that sense, precisely because one belongs to a minority or one's a woman who could be snuffed out with ease, one is a Palestinian whose, whose life could be taken and will be rationalized as, as a security, uh, uh, as the collateral damage of a security problem. Um, if, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm part of a scene of war in North Africa or I'm a migrant, you know, in trying to pass through the Mediterranean, I mean, they, I mean these are just some examples of way too many. Um, or if I live in a part of the world that's never getting a vaccine and is being ravaged by COVID and doesn't have adequate health care. I mean, I'm part of an ab ab abandoned population, one that sees itself in light of the global distribution of health care as, as ungrievable like i can be lost and it will not matter and in fact there may be policies that assume or calculate that this loss doesn't really matter so we should put our resources elsewhere um so it, there's a phenomenological sense one might say of a feeling that one is grievable or ungrievable or maybe a flickering sense like i'm grievable in one community and radically ungrievable in another and i pass between those communities seeing that difference feeling that uh, deconstitution of my value in one domain and, and, uh, and the constitution of my value in another, which is, I think, a very difficult way to live. And um, so being grievable is different from, you also use the language of vulnerable, but this is something different. This is a, you've got quite a nuanced way of distinguishing between grievable and then vulnerable and then dependent as well, I suppose. You, the, the, these are separatable um, categories, if I can call them that. Yes. I, I wonder, could you say a little bit then about what it is to be vulnerable? Yes. Well, I think uh, many people understand vulnerability as a subjective state, right? We say, oh, I'm feeling vulnerable today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, don't talk to me about that. I'm vulnerable today. Or... Um, it's a human rights category, like can you establish your vulnerability in order to pass through this particular um, uh, immigration uh, yeah. procedure? And you, you literally, I mean, in, the, in the, Greek, in the Greek camps for the migrants, you, you had to work to establish and produce a vulnerability paper that documented mm -hmm. the fact that you would be persecuted if you returned home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, We've human. had that here in the UK as well, our immigration process. Yes, really similar. frightening the, the UK detention camps, um, mm -hmm. which is another, uh, another topic altogether. Uh, but um, although <laughs> pertinent to the question of uh, ungrievable lives, but, but, vulnerable, but what I worry about is uh, <laughs> people who say, well, the point is to overcome vulnerability right, to overcome vulnerability and then you'll be in, invulnerable or um, I'm vulnerable today, but tomorrow I'll be better, uh, meaning I'll be strong. Will, will I have overcome my vulnerability or will I still be uh, a creature for whom vulnerability is an essential part of living the world? Um, when I pass through the, the immigration procedure and arrive somewhere, am I Am I invulnerable? No, I'm not. I mean, the the opposite of vulnerability is not uh, invulnerability. It's not that's that's what we seek to be. That would be terrible. Um, no. I actually think it's the the models of uh, self sufficient, invulnerable, 
um, humans that uh, that that model has gotten us into many of the problems we're 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 the seeing today. Crusoe idea. Yeah, or individual self sufficiency. I think yeah. that vulnerability establishes us as social creatures. Like. There's no way to be a human being embodied in this world without being vulnerable to the elements, to the question of shelter, to food, to others. I mean, we are vulnerable. Uh, it's 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 a it's a relationship to all that sustains us. It's a relationship to all that threatens what sustains us. So for me, vulnerability is not a subjective state, nor is it merely a legal status. It is a feature of our interconnected lives. And if we're smart. <laughs> I think we will read vulnerability as a as a as a reflection on that interconnectedness, that interdependency. If I'm vulnerable to another, I depend on that other not to hurt me. Mm -hmm. um, so they are linked. And when I cannot depend on that, then my vulnerability is intensified. If I'm if I'm vulnerable to the elements, I depend on there being shelter. But if there is no shelter and I can't get access to shelter, then my vulnerability is intensified now there should be shelter and there should be norms that prevent me from being physically injured by others um, but that means we need to organize our social world that in such a way that acknowledges our interdependency and provides for that um, so uh, they are interconnected notions but if my my vulnerability is so intensified lack of food or shelter or uh, un unmitigated exposure to violence, then then my life can be expunged and, and it can be expunged quite easily. And the failure of those social policies that result in my destruction or death, uh, they, they have established me as ungrievable since if I had been grievable, I would have been of value and those provisions would have been there for me so that I could have lived. So they are linked, you know, they are linked. Right, and there's, um, I suppose, the danger of um, of trying to relate to people that we might deem vulnerable is that we become paternalistic in some sense. True. Um, and one of the phrases that you sort of steer clear of, I think, in the book is the notion of love. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't mean that you would necessarily feel some form of um eros or charis or something towards another so much as a political notion of love where you seek the welfare of a community to which you don't necessarily belong this at least is the hebraic notion of political love i think you know seek the welfare of the city you've been sent to in exile can you say a little about what it means to um em embody the kind of um political responsibilities that you would like to move readers towards without becoming paternalistic. And because you're vulnerable, we'll establish a dependency relationship with you um, or we'll yeah. intensify that dependency relationship. Yes. Well, I think certain organizations of the welfare state have um, taken on that paternalistic uh, structure, but I do think that there are um, there are forms of uh, social democracy that don't have to do that. And that's, of course, a wider question, like how do you build social services through and with communities and through and with grassroots movements so that the services become part of self-government, they become part of um, the way a community governs itself and serves itself. Um, but uh, the main point about love, which is of course always tricky is that I do think that the interdependency I'm talking about, or even the wish to live in a world that is less violent, if not nonviolent, comes from a concern for others and a way of positioning oneself in a, in a network of others or in a, an expanding field of interdependent lives. Um, one could see that as a, as a, a strong form of, I guess, um, agape or I mean I don't I don't know I mean you could you could call it love I, th I think mm. <clears throat> that Hannah Arendt tries to do that in in various moments um, I don't have a problem with that what I have a problem with is the idea that love relations are free of aggression or conflict and um, 
And this is where I turn to Freud, who um, is really very clear that the most intense love relations, the most crucial ones, are have ambivalence in them. That um, you know, there are some points where he says love is the combination of love and hate, and that that's what we negotiate when we are in loving relations. Um, and other times he establishes a polarity. Um, love is over here and, um, and destruction is over there. Um, but I, I'm interested in the fact that he can't settle it himself. Yeah. <laughs> he seems to waver, right? He seems to waver. I think, well, maybe that's what we do is, is waver. We sometimes think, oh, love. We need love rather than hate. We need affirmation rather than destruction. But maybe, um, in fact, the kind of, kinds of creatures we are is there's enormous attachment, passion, in life enhancement, and there's also enormous fear. This could undermine me. This could mm. uh, this could undo me. This 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 could kill me. Um, I'm not going to survive this. Or oh, I can only survive with this. Right? We we have a whole spectrum of uh, feelings about love, whether they're um, interpersonal or communal mm. or and the love of the nation. You know, I always am scared of that. Mm. Um, you know, I love the nation, so I hate over here. It's like, no, actually, the nation has its own conflict. Love and hate are already here, and love and hate are over there, too. Yeah. And what if we accept it as a kind of challenge, ethical and political, to um, accept the, the hatred, the destruction as impulses, as tendencies, as, as possibilities that belong to us? We can't just externalize them and say, oh, they belong to others. They are the destructive ones over there. Like, no, we, we struggle with that. That's part of the struggle to become more loving <laughs> is to accept one's aggression and the, the, the less than loving dimensions of who we are. I suppose. I mean, I can't help thinking of um, Slavoj Žižek, for instance, who talks about the trauma of, of love at a very personal level. But it, even decent friendships that I've got, the people I've stayed friends with are people who can tell me what I really don't want to hear and that we won't talk to each other for a week after those conversations. But that's the most lovingly, and somehow the most violent, is it hateful, violent? I don't know what it is. It's confrontation and it's friction and it's discord in some sense. Perhaps because of the yes. wild, wider field of relationality that you're talking about. Um, people with the capacity to hurt me I suppose those are the people that I would love. Um, <laughs> well, maybe it goes the other. I think it maybe it goes the other way around. I mean, I'm not okay, sure, yeah. but I mean, there are a lot, of, a lot of people with the capacity to hurt me. Who I I don't think of myself as loving at all, um, and who don't actually know me, okay, <laughs> but would take yeah. me down anyway. Uh, and then there are those who I am in relationship with and. Let's just call it passionate, a passionate relation of some kind or another. It doesn't have to be intimate or sexual, but passionate. And, and they may confront me or they may uh, call mm. me to account and they may be rough with me. And it could be, and it could take me a while to understand that as rough love. Right? I'm passionate. Not make... passionate is the capacity to suffer, isn't it? Yes. Speaking. Yes. It's and, and I think if we think of love as a passion, well, it is a place where we have heightened sense of our injurability uh, at the same time that it's life enhancing um, and even life giving. Um, and those things are bound up together. And, you know, dependency is also, uh, on the one hand, uh, it can be enormously compelling. On the other hand, it can be enormously threatening. And I, I think we we have to deal with that. So, for instance, hmm. in some of the work um, I I did on um, on Palestine, it, it was very clear to me that even when uh, Israeli Jews and Pal and Palestinians, either within the Israeli state as it's currently constituted or in the occupied zones, um, or indeed in the diaspora you know, they, there would be all kinds of conflict, but there was also um, uh, a, a kind of proximity and a way in which they understood themselves as interdependent. They couldn't, you know, even a wall can't 
can't sever the dependency. I mean, they 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 literally share a, a, a land, even though it's not equally owned, but you know, there is this proximity, and that proximity is both intolerable and inevitable. So if we think about international relations that are very much bound up with conflict, mm. they they're also in some sense um, functions of interdependency that can't be denied and that have to be dealt with. Um, and you know, I tell a story uh, about uh, an Israeli journalist who said, "Well, you know, we've had enough with the Palestinians. We're going to divorce them." And I said, "Look, <laughs> divorces tend to recapitulate the and intensify whatever was going wrong with the relationship to begin with." I said, that's, not not the, that's not the end. That's not the end. That just means you're going to like live forever in this state of impasse, right? Like. <laughs> You know, there wasn't a way to, to resolve the story, in other words, you know. That's, but learning that's to, to, to deal story. with that conflict, learning to deal with conflict as a as part of the way of life. And there are better and worse ways. Violence is the worst way, right? Okay. Um, yeah. and, and there are, but there are ways of staying in con con conflict. And it's, it's also true in social movements. Uh, and... Um, it's, but I think it's healthier, it's better to have those conflicts open and to be able to negotiate them um, in their difficulty than to allow it to um, become a, a question of violence. Yeah. Can, can I ask you then from a slightly, diff, slightly different perspective about violence? Um, the, at, the, at the sharp end, you know, you talk about the violence of the blow. Um, I have a background where I've dished out the blow and I've been on the receiving end of it in, in multiple settings. Uh, and now I'm in Cambridge in a very nice liberal pacifist place where lots of academics feel duty bound in a slightly self-righteous way of pronouncing in my direction their pacifism and yet can well, remain. They might, they might be dealing their blows in a different way. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That's, that's how I've usually experienced um, pacifist pronouncements, uh, especially when it comes from a place where there's complete complicity with systemic violence that has become invisible. And I, I wonder whether you might say something about how in Western academic liberalism, how a commitment to nonviolence might actually look in practical terms. Well, um, I, I would say um, that the, the political dismantling of violent institutions, which would include detention camps and, and the entire carceral system, mm -hmm. is an example of, of um, political action we can take that would radically diminish the pervasive character of violence. And that violence is, well, in my country, um, disproportionately directed against black and brown communities, men and women um, and, and minors. Um, but also, as we know, globally migrants um, are perhaps the dominant community subjected to uh, carceral uh, containment. Um, so there's that. I also think, quite frankly, that in in settings where violence breaks out, let's say there's police violence, or let's say there's uh, an attack on a woman or a vulnerable uh, person on the street, um, you know, we do intervene, we stop the blow. And I think feminist self-defense is an extremely important model for me. I think there are other self-defense um, practices that are also important, but there's a French philosopher, Elsa Dorlin, who um, has written, I think, quite beautifully and persuasively about self-defense um, and what it means to stop a blow, you, to use the body to stop a blow, to allow the body to become an obstruction, mm -hmm. uh, to stop a blow. Now, I, I think that that is a way of entering into the field of force. Um, and here I would use force rather than violence. It's also maybe an aggressive act. You know, like if I put myself between two people who are, um, who are in an altercation or where one person is obviously being beaten or 
is threatened by another. If I put, if I put myself there and I, I take the blow or I divert the, deflect the, the blow, I'm, I'm using my body not to destroy that person, but to stop that person from destruction. Now that's a judgment call. Um, and it's very hard from outside the situation to tell somebody this is what you should do and not do. But I do think there is a kind of maxim one can use, which is, am I putting my body in the way of a blow? Or am I using my body to deliver a blow? And of course, it may be the case that the I know it becomes extremely hard if you are uh, delivering a blow to stop the person from delivering more blows. <laughs> uh, right. I mean, you won't be able to do that in a way I could not, given my age and size and and um, and uh, the condition of my joints. <laughs> but um, um, there are some situations where I can do that and have done that. It was a situation where a, a woman was coming after me in Brazil and she did want me dead. She thought I was a radical gender theorist who was um, uh, going to um, turn all the children gay or that I was a pedophile. I mean, there, were, there was a lot of phantasmatic um, material there and she came after me and I think and she, with a cart in an airport and she was going to push me and push me down and who knows what would have happened in that situation and some young man in a backpack, I'll never know his name, but I love him and I would leave him my royalty checks. I don't know, I, I wish I could find him. But he, he threw his body in, into the fray and stopped her from reaching me. He saw the situation, he threw his body into the fray and he stopped her from doing damage to me. But when I got on, a, on the elevator, escalator rather, and looked back down, I saw he was being pummeled. And it broke my heart, but he agreed to be pummeled. He knew he knew he could get he 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 was pummeled until the airport police came and uh, tore the two of them apart. But he took the blow for me, so that I would not um, I would not take the blow. I mean, how do we describe that? That's you know, in, in a way, it was um, it was an extraordinary gift to me. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry yeah. that he took the blow, but I understood that he was intervening in an act of violence to stop its execution. That's courage, isn't it? There, yeah. it was stunning. And in the heat of the moment, it's it's an instinctive reaction. Uh, as well. He didn't have he didn't have time to go back and do a utilitarian calculus or read. <laughs> wasn't. I was like, oh, excuse me, I got to read my Kant. You know, he was yeah. like. <laughs> Made his judgment, right? That the movement was his judgment. Well, on the subject of examples, just can I move you to final question? Sure. Um, a theological perspective. Um, the nonviolence demanded by Jesus in the Gospels is very much an aggressive, demanding call for passive resistance, a almost defiance by overcompliance in the context of the Roman Empire. But for many, being aggressively nonviolent, which I think is your phrase, um, it seems self-contradictory. And I wondered if you have some more examples of how aggressive nonviolence might work in reality. Um, I think, well, I think it's very interesting, the problem of Jesus, since, you know, unfortunately, the turn, turn the other cheek modality has become a kind of trope. And um, at least in my world, people, I'm not gonna turn the other cheek. You know, like, yeah, that's, a, um, like that's a weak thing to do. Yeah. But um, if you really are turning the other cheek to receive a blow in order to stop <laughs> some other um, uh, violence from unfolding, you're actually using your body as an obstruction. And we see that in the case of, um, um, uh, of, of human human chains uh, that that function as 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 barriers uh, in in protest movements and um, I think we can actually see that in Latin America we see it in Turkey we see it in it's a it's a well established practice of uh, civil disobedience uh, where in fact you know you're going to take the blow but you have power you have a you have power in collective action you've you've stopped the army or the police from 
moving uh, forward, from uh, being able to uh, deal their blows or to uh, complete their action. So there is something very powerful in, in the human chain, the human barrier, um, something very difficult to do. And of course, as an individual, it's a heroic act, but as a collective, you see something about like, what is your strength? Um, similarly, the, the feminist uh, Ni Una Menos, the group um, from Argentina, together with other groups in Chile, like Las Tesas, they, they flood the streets. The police have to get off the streets because there's no room for them. <laughs> and they own the streets for the first time, right? They flood the streets with their, with their bodies. And it's very aggressive. It's like we're taking over, we're laying claim. Uh, nobody can pass. Uh, this is our home. This street is our home, right? The street is usually the place you run through in order not to get attacked, to get home, and hopefully you live with somebody who doesn't do violence to you. But, you know, th these are aggressive. They're incredibly aggressive, but they're not violent. So, and I think, look, there are forms of speech, and, and I, I guess I do think that aggressive forms of speech are sometimes necessary, even if they're disturbing, um, in order to show the unacceptability of certain social conditions. We, we don't always need to be speaking in highly, you know, highly, highly civil ways. Um, I think we need to allow for outcry and for the scream uh, and for, for loud grief and, um, um, and, and these sorts of, of passionate movements. They're, they're not violent, but they can be enormously aggressive. So I don't think we can do without aggression. I think the people who think they're without it uh, are sometimes the most unknowing about how they're wielding it. So in my view, we need to become more knowing and we need to refine aggression into tactics that work um, without allowing them to become violent and without allowing them to mirror the forms of and reproduce the forms of violence that we oppose. That sounds like a great place to finish. Judith Butler, thank you very much indeed. April is in my mistress' face. April is in my mistress' face.